Hi, welcome back to Logic. This is our third week. Okay. Uh, and the next thing we need to notice here is that there's another thing called the square of opposition. And the square of opposition actually comes from Aristotle. Um, and the square of opposition represents the logical relationship among these four propositions, the A, the E, the I, and the O, right? And there's two types of prop two types of uh, square, two, um, cut that, there's two squares of opposition. There's the traditional square of opposition, which is the one Aristotle came up with. And it's more complicated. We're actually going to start with the modern square of opposition, which represents a very kind of reduced understanding of how these um, propositional terms, no, I'm sorry, not terms, propositional statements relate. And what we'll find is that really what the modern square of opposition shows us is it shows us that um, the A and the O statement are contradictory. And one thing I should note here is the concept and logic of bivalence. Bivalence is the notion that there's only tr two truth values, true and false. There's no in-between in logic such that if a state, well, in a certain way there is an in-between, and that's the logically undetermined. That's basically where we put a question mark down. That's because we don't have enough information. But at the heart of it, or at the very bottom, we should say that something, is a proposition or a statement is either true or false. And this is, and it's the same thing with the other two propositions in the, in the square of opposition, namely the, um, the E and the I proposition, right? If I say, no men are immortal, and then I say over here, some men are immortal, right? Clearly they're opposites, hence they're contradictory, right? Such that if we can utilize the modern square of opposition to understand um, how different statements relate in terms of their truth value, and furthermore, and we can use it to determine whether or not certain types of immediate inference arguments actually work. Now, so an immediate inference statement, for instance, would be an example would be if you say, um, all men are mortal, right? Therefore, it is false that um, some men are not mortal, right? They have the opposite truth value. And if I say this one's true, and I, and, then my, and I infer that this one's false, we can use the square of opposition to determine that that's actually a valid argument. That actually works. They're logically equivalent statements, right? Saying that one's true and the opposite's false. Um, and logical equivalence just means that there's a necessary relationship among the truth values there, and there is, and the square of opposition shows that. And uh, next week we'll talk about the traditional square of opposition, it's going to get much more complicated. Now, um, you're probably wondering what exactly is at the core of the difference between the modern and the traditional square of opposition. Now, in a certain way, we'll slowly unfold what this means, but the whole matter really goes down to another philosopher by the name of George Boole. And George Bull is famous for this idea of what's called the existential fallacy, and and I'll be talking about this in a variety of different on a variety of different occasions because it's really going to become a key concept that we're just going to talk about over and over. Um, but the existential fallacy is something that George Bull comes up with, and what he says essentially, and maybe this is the first way we can think about understanding, is that our universal statements, right, all men are mortal, and no men are immortal, right, those are our examples, that these actually do not imply existence. That's what it essentially comes down to. For Boole, only particular statements apply, imply ex the existence of something, right? And that actually should make a lot of sense, right? If I say that all men are mortal, right, George Boole would say it is therefore, it would be incorrect to infer from that that some men are mortal. Right? Why would that seems to make sense actually, right? If you say all men are mortal, shouldn't it be the case that some men are mortal? Bull doesn't think so. And the reason he doesn't think so is because universals don't tell us about anything about the world. Universal statements, that is. Why? Because none of us actually have universal knowledge. Right? I actually haven't gone out, you know, and met every human being <laughs> to make sure that they actually are all mortal. And because I don't have the universal knowledge of that, it would be, strictly speaking, incorrect for me to assume that um, from there that, that some men are mortal. So universals don't necessarily tell me that the particulars exist. 
and this is called the existential fallacy, and it's about whether or not our statements are actually implying the existence of things. In week four, I'm going to detail this in greater detail. I'll probably throw a few examples up on the whiteboard for you and give you a sense of why this is important and what it precisely this means. If it sounds, I'm sure, I know it sounds fairly abstract right now, but it's going to have fairly crucial consequences to come. Right. But the square of opposition is very simple. Start with an X, right? And then you put your A proposition, your E proposition, your I proposition, and your O proposition. Now, of course, it's a square, so let's draw some lines and make it into a square. And what the modern square of opposition says is the A proposition is always has the opposite truth value of the O proposition. So we can just write in here that this is contradictory. Likewise, the E and the I proposition are also contradictory. So I'll just, I'll just write con T, just because I don't want to write it all. Right? So this is contradictory and this is contradictory, right? So what this means is if you have a true A proposition, you have a false O proposition. Conversely, if you have a true I proposition, that means you must have a false E proposition, right? So let's take an example, right? Let's say we have some people are nice. I think that was our last example. That was one of our examples. Some people are not nice. Now, here's your subject and here's your predicate, right? Over here are the reverse statement, the contradictory statement would say that no people are nice. Right? Where we have the same subject and the same predicate class. That's important. It doesn't work. The square of opposition doesn't work if they have different terms, terms. So if I say that it is false, that some people are nice, then it's necessarily true that there are no people that are nice. Now obviously that seems to be wrong, <laughs> right? So let's say that I say that it's true that some people are nice, which I in fact do think, then I would say that it's false that no people are nice. Okay? Does that make sense there? I hope so. Obviously you can't, I can't hear you, so hopefully it does. Right? Uh, and you, it's interesting because you can see this in the Venn diagram, right? So let's draw, remember, let's do our E Venn diagram here. Right, which says that no S or P, which looks like this, uh, and then let's do our O, right, which says that some S or P, and we represent it with an X in the middle. You can see these mean the opposite things, because here it's filled in, which means there's nothing, um, there's nothing that connects the S and P, and here I'm preci saying precisely that there is something in the very center. So therefore you can just represent it using the Venn diagram and see that it has the opposite truth value. And just obviously it's going to be the same for the A and the O, but let's show you how that works too, right? So the, the A proposition, right, all S or P is going to look like this. Right? And then the O proposition says what? That there's, right, here's our S and our P, us up here. This says, right, some people are not nice, which means that, right, some people are not nice, which you say in your head. There's at least one person out there who's not in the class of niceness. But look at the A proposition. That says the very opposite, that there can never be anything in this region. Right? Namely, that all the people are nice. Right? So clearly, they have contradictory values. Now, the question, though, is what's the relationship between this one and this one? Actually, it's undetermined. Um, we don't know. Right? So let's put a question mark. Um, same thing goes here. We don't know what the relationship is. What's the logical relationship between these two? Unknown. What's the, and the same thing goes for here. Right? So there's the modern square of opposition. It's unknown. In my uh, lecture next week, or my video next week, I'll, we're, when we go over the traditional square of opposition, Aristotle's square of opposition, he actually gives us uh, logical definitions for these relationships. But the reason we don't have them here is because of the existential fallacy. Um, but I'm going to get into that next week, and you can see that um, then.